Well, good morning, church. I'm just going to do a refresher. Um, a while back, I spoke about the eagle and I spoke about the guardians of the covenant, and we were talking about the angels that were before the throne of God. And if you remember, we picked up Revelation chapter 4, 6 to 8, and this is what it says. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and beyond, behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes, all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, can anyone remember, I held up some signs last time, and there were different things on the back of them. Do you remember? What did the lion represent? The Lord. There we go. We remember that phrase, love the Lord your God with all your... with all your... and with all your... Soul. Now I'm repeating obviously Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 6 does not mention mind. It mentions heart, soul and strength. Because in the mindset of the Hebrews, the heart symbolized not just the emotion or the personality of a person, it symbolized also the mind. And obviously when we read it in the Greek, the same word for um, heart in Greek does not have that association. So there is another word added to include the mind in the New Testament when Jesus is talking to the rich young ruler about what the greatest commandments are. So we knew that the lion was the Lord. Can anyone remember what the eagle was? Because we spoke on the eagle last time. Love the Lord your God with all your soul or spirit in some translations. That ability to transcend beyond the, the earthly remit and to reach out and to go to places that you cannot reach in the flesh. It's a spiritual thing. You know, we are of the resurrection. When we die, our spirits do not remain buried. They go to be with the Lord. As he spoke to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Does not mean that his body was with him in paradise. As Paul says, there are those who go to sleep in the Lord, that sense that your body dies and waits for the Lord to come before it is raised. This is the second resurrection. But the Spirit rises up to be with him. And in Hebrews it talks of the great cloud of witnesses who are bearing watch over what is going on in the here and now. Those who've gone before us, so to speak. Can anyone remember what the human represented? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. There we go. Heart, mind, emotion, personality. That's what makes a human unique above all of God's creation. And in these aspects, we see the final one is the bull or the ox. And that represents strength and power, which we've been singing about all morning. And Sid Paul have read my notes. You know, we've been talking about the power of God, the strength of God. So we're going to talk today about being as strong as an ox. What is interesting about these four animals that we've talked about, including human beings, is that the four Gospels associated themselves in early Christianity with each of these animals, like the Lordship of Christ we can often find in the book of, Mark, uh, book of Matthew, where it talks about the King that is to come, the Messiah, the Promised One, the generations that he belonged to of old. And then we talk about the Spirit or the Soul, we talk about the Gospel of John. We talk about the heart and the mind. We talk about the gospel of Mark and the strength, which is the ox. We talk about the gospel of Luke because its focus is more on the temple and the sacrifice that Jesus has made. 
and we see throughout church history that they had these animals associated with these Gospels whenever they had artwork or artistry. And it's a beautiful example that how before the throne of God we see four aspects of Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind. Who is the one who loves the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and all his mind? It's Jesus himself. We aspire to love with all that we have, but we fall short. He is the one who loved with all that he had. Nevertheless, Father, not my will be done, but yours. And he took the cross onto himself. What an example we have. What strength we have. In his weakness, we have been made strong. I don't know about you, but there are times in my own life where I go through seasons and I think, oh, wow, I, I've done good today. And there are other times when I look at it and I think, wow, Thursday was a bit of a mess. <laughs> you know? You think, oh, we've only I could just remain in this good place. But we know that we cannot do anything in the flesh, in our own strength but at least we can try to follow after him. And through his spirit, he can take us to places that we never thought that we could go. One of the things that I like about oxer balls is their strength. When I was younger, I used to uh, do a class in GCSE. Um, I made the mistake of not getting my option choices in on time. So I was just left with the, all the options that nobody wanted, so I had to do drama. Um, I had to do rural science. Does anyone know what rural science is? Well, <laughs> rural science is interesting, teaching you all about farming and all the different things that go on with farming and stuff. And so I got to meet with a group of guys who were farmers. And one of the beautiful things about it is we'd go out and we'd go have fun and we'd have a nice time together. And as young people, you do things that you dare each other to do. And one of these things that we felt that we would go and do and have fun doing was pushing cows over while they were sleeping. And so one night we'd gone out to a field in the middle of nowhere and there was this lone cow just standing all by itself. And we thought, right, this is our opportunity to go and see if they just fall over if you push them. So we ran over to this cow, thinking that we would go and push it over, only to find out it wasn't a cow at all. That's why it was in the field by itself. And if we'd had listened and we read all our work that we had in rural science, we would have known this. So we ended up running away from this bull that had lost its temper at us and scrambling over barbed wire fences to get away and running through ditches and stuff like that. It was funny, but it was not funny at the same time. We were laughing and we were crying. Bulls are strong. Bulls are something to be feared. Bulls have power and strength. And often the reason why we fear bulls is because of the horns. And there's something beautiful about bulls and oxen in the Bible. It's one of the only animals that's mentioned in the Ten Commandments twice. And the two things that the bulls mentioned with in the Ten Commandments is number one, the Sabbath, the rest, not working your animals to death, trusting God that He will provide for you that you don't have to work all the hours that God sends because his provision is there. So spare the oxen, spare the donkey, so to speak. The other is in not envying somebody else because they've got a nicer bull than you or a nicer oxen than you. It's about material things. It's about desiring things which belong to other people. And so we see the power that is represented in the bull is about provision. It's about being able to make a living. It's about fertility. It's about food. It's about sacrifice. But at the same time, it's also the representative of the powers behind the material realm. 
and their motivations. That you can desire your neighbor's oxen. The lust. The seeking for something which you don't have. That you're envious of. And these powers and these emotions that are surrounded with this animal are strong. There's sometimes, for some people, there's no breaking these powers. I want to talk about three things today. To understand, firstly, we're not to be like a bull in a china shop. about unharnessed power, about power that is not restrained, about power that is not used in the right way. This is man's responsibility for when God gave the earth to humankind, he gave humankind power and authority. But he wanted them to harness it said he created the world, he told them to go and subdue the world. But instead, mankind was subdued by creation. Even now, mankind worships creation and not the one who created. We need to harness power in the right place. We need to understand that we have power and strength And that power and strength needs to be harnessed and not seeking to be out of control like a so-called bull in a china shop. Secondly, we need to take the bull by its horns. We need to sacrifice power and we need to follow after the one who is all-powerful. So we need to subject the power that we have in our lives. And thirdly, we need to take his yoke and carry his burden. We need to bear the right influence. I always find it funny, you know, when you watch YouTube, they call themselves influencers. It's very demonic. People who influence people, who desire to change people's mindsets, their hearts, and focus on things. And influencing in itself can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. God calls us to be disciples, those who teach, those who train people to be fishers of men for his kingdom, for his course, for his purpose. But there are people out there who disciple people in their own ways, in their own image for their own desire, for their own followers, and for their own worship. There's three stories I want to take us to when we look at these three parts. The first is found in Judges chapter 6, 25 to 32. And it's a story of Gideon. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull, from your father's herd, the one who is seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal. Cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of the height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Here we see unharnessed power in God's people. They're called to represent God. They're called to respond to God's word. The problem is they've responded to another influence. They've responded to another power. And Gideon isn't devoid of this. He's a part of this situation because the power is represented very strongly in his father's house. It's not down the road. It's not in somebody else's household. It's not with the Gentiles. It is in the believer or the one who hears God's voice household. 
the unharnessed power. And there is an unharnessed power in every one of our houses if we don't keep it under check. We need to view what is going on in our household and take seriously that we respond to God's Word in spirit and in truth. And that we identify the times when we follow Baal and the times when we follow Christ. It's interesting that the altar of Baal was a human being with horns. And that's why you see Satan often depicted as a human being with horns. It comes from the Baalite sort of idols. Another interesting fact to do with Baal as well is that the animal that was symbolic of Baal was the bull. And so when you see in the Old Testament and they're talking about the Ten Commandments, there they are, they've asked Aaron to make a god for themselves and what do they make? They make a golden calf, a bull. He teaches them that it wasn't God who freed you from Egypt, it was the Baals that freed you from Egypt because they wondered what had happened to Moses, the one who had spoken about who Yahweh is, and who the one who had no image. They couldn't handle this imageless God, and they sought to make an image for themselves that they might worship, because they were looking for power, and they were looking for strength. And when they came into the Promised Land, they saw a land filled with milk and honey. The gods of this land provided wealth for the people who dwelt in that land and they desired to be wealthy like the people who were in the land. And God's covenant and God's promise was to them not to follow those gods. Stop focusing on the prosperity. Stop focusing on the blessings of this world. Because the blessings of this world also come with curses. And here is Gideon. Instead of doing the word of God and tearing down the altars of the Canaanites, they've raised an altar in his father's house, worshipping the very gods they were supposed to subdue. The powers had overtaken their hearts, their minds, and their souls, and you couldn't discern who were the people of God and who were the pagans in the land. And God is calling to his church in the UK today, be discerning. Because there are people who call themselves Christians, they are not following Christ, they are following the Baal God. The one who gives them power and strength. When the God that we worship, in your weakness, I am made strong. My God doesn't have to beat people up to get people to do what he wants them to do. He lays down and dies and takes it all on himself. And if he needs to sort somebody out and bind the spirit, he sends a servant, a messenger. For it was Michael who bound the devil and threw him out of heaven. God didn't even have to get his hands dirty with Satan, though he got his hands dirty for us. This is another beautiful thing about oxen and bull. There's a beautiful proverb where it talks about if the manger is empty, let me see if I can find it for you. Proverbs 14 verse 4, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. This is a beautiful verse. What it's basically saying is that if you want results, things are going to be messy. Because if you've ever looked after oxen, horses, or any other animal that eats grass or grazes, it's not a clean thing to do. You have to get your hands dirty. And God works with oxen. He likes to plough. We're going to look at another text where it talks about Jesus as if Jesus is a bull. As if Jesus is a power. 
But before we get there, we're, we're seeing in this story that all of a sudden God has told Gideon to take the second bowl. What is he saying? He's saying that this power is not worthy of the best. We're going to defeat it with the second best. He takes the second bull that's been alive for seven years. Why seven years? Because under seven years of hardship, they faced the enemy. God gave them over to their sin. So he's talking about an animal that has never experienced a season under the rulership of God. But has lived during the time of oppression, hardship. And he's telling him to take this animal the very symbol of Baal he uses to destroy the altar of Baal. And more often than not, this is what happens to the enemies of God. They destroy themselves with their own strength. Because as Gideon moves on, we find out that Gideon doesn't have to lay a finger or a hand because the Midianites, when they see the light, they hear the trumpet, they start to get confused and all agitated and think that they're surrounded and they start fighting against each other. And I think this is more often the situation that God's people need to understand, that true power relies on God to act and doesn't seek to take the power into their own hands. There are too many Christians taking power into their own hands and trying to slay the enemy when it's God's wrath. It's God's anger. Love your enemies. In doing so, you heap burning coals on top of their heads. You know, love can be painful, it can be hard. But the truth be known, God wants to give grace to every human being that is on this planet. But every human being has to make a decision, one which will be for God or one that will be against. When we talk in Isaiah chapter 2 about how he has beaten your swords into plowshares, we're talking about peace with God but in the world you will have trouble. You will face the powers. Your enemy is not flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. Bulls that need to be sacrificed and brought down. Which brings us to our next story. 1 Kings 19, 19 to 21. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they eat. And then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. Full of symbolism in this text. The twelve oxen symbolized the tribes of Judah. But also, if we go into the New Testament, we find that Jesus selected 12 disciples. That sense of plowing, making ready the land. That sense of unity, together in a common purpose. That sense of yoked, that sense of the same identity, they were all oxen. That sense of being led by one person, a man, Elisha, symbolizing Christ. As he goes behind the oxen, putting them in order. That must be some skill, because you should have seen the plows that they used in those days. You know, if you just as such turned your attention in the wrong direction, you would make a mess of what was going on, or you would blunt 
the blade of the plow that was following behind because it was a very skillful task to do. It needed all your strength, but to not just be plowing with two oxen, but with 12, this man had some skill, some power. But it also talks about the fact that these oxen didn't just belong to Elisha. This was a community effort. Two of the oxen were his. They belonged to him. And what does he do? He sacrifices the oxen. It's interesting, isn't it, that you know when you go to the altar that's in the temple, there are horns on the altar. The horns symbolize the power. And every time... Once in a year, they would take a bull and it was on the Day of Atonement. They would take that bull, they would slaughter the bull, they would take the blood of the bull, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Christ, and they would smear on the horns of the altar. There's power in the blood. Here is Elisha, he takes the very means of his own provision. He takes his whole provision and he gives it to the Lord. And says, I will follow after you. But not just content with that, he shares it with the other people so that they are aware that he has a calling on his life and there's no going back because they will remind him, oh Elisha, you're back Did you fail? Did you do the things that God had called you to do? Did you speak the things God had called you to do? Elisha was setting in process a no-returns policy. He bought into the Word of God that had come to his life, and he said, I'm going to be who God has called me to be, and I'm going to make sure that I am not tempted to be like Lot's wife and turn back and go back to the way things used to be. I'm putting these balls on the line for you, Jesus. I'm sacrificing everything I have for God's people that they might hear His word in the right season. And in some way, Elisha represents Jesus. And how he sacrificed everything he had Even foxes have homes, he said. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The only things he had were the clothes on his back, and even the clothes on his back they took off and they bartered it among themselves. He came into the world, and everything he was given was stripped away, taken away, so that he might have an inheritance far more powerful than what this world has to offer. And he calls to his church, do not store treasures on earth, but store treasures in heaven that are unperishable. Follow the call of Elisha. Even when Jesus is calling his own people, he says in Luke 61 to 62, yet another said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Another time in Luke 14, verse 19, you see many different people coming up to Jesus with an excuse as to why they cannot follow after him. Some are buying yoke of oxen and looking after what they have to do with their business and their marketplace. Others are seeking to be married. Others are seeking to bury those who've died. And Jesus says to them all, forget that. Come follow me. Prioritize the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and all else will be added unto you. But the problem is we sometimes have selective hearing. Are you calling me, Lord? Are you speaking to me, Lord? Final paragraph, Matthew eleven twenty-seven 27 to 30. This is the most important. All things have been committed to me. All things 
have been committed to me. All powers, all strength belongs to him and have been given to him by his Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal to him. So we have an Elijah moment. Come follow me. Come follow me. Come follow me. Come follow me. This is not an optional extra. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to have eternal life, you do not have a choice other than to follow him. There are powers and principalities that are lying to humanity today that humanity has a choice. Humanity has no choice because God has decided to choose the Son. And the Son is enough. You don't need anybody else other than Jesus Christ in your life. And if you abandon him to follow after somebody else, then you will be lost. You will be burned. You will be destroyed. But if you seek after him with your whole heart, then you will have an inheritance. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. He doesn't want the streak strong. He doesn't want the muscle men. He doesn't want the powers. He wants the weak. Be truthful. I find all the time, you know, when you watch some of the things on Facebook and Instagram, the falseness that's indicated. When people show their lives as if it's picture perfect. Look at the beautiful meal that I'm having. Oh look, I've just woken up out of bed and I've got my makeup on and I'm looking perfect. You know, look at my strong side, the muscles that I have here, but don't look at my back muscles, I need to work on them. You know, the whitewashed walls that we see when it talks about the Pharisees are in today's wor world. The politicians who promise you everything, but the truth is, they don't have the power. They don't have the strength. The false religions out there that talk about power and strength, but in truth be known, they're bound. Because the enemy is bound. Satan is bound. He's on a leash because of what Christ has done. All those who are weak, weary, and burdened, I will give you rest. This follows suit with one of the Ten Commandments. Do you remember we talked about the oxen being mentioned twice in the Ten Commandments? And one of the times was to do with the Sabbath. You know, don't work on this that, that, that day. Why? Because give your oxen a rest. We're so busy working, 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 everybody working. We have to work all the time. But the truth be known, that's not faith. Faith knows how to rest. Let your struggling and striving cease. Be still and know that I am God. But you can't be still. You keep having to speak and you don't want to listen because you think that you've got to keep going when God says, rest. You who are weary and heavy laden, take on my yoke. This is a beautiful analogy because there's a verse in the Old Testament where it talks about don't yoke a donkey to an oxen. Is anybody really tall here? Anyone over six foot two? Raise your hands. 
And I'll be measuring afterwards if nobody puts their hands up. Anyone over six foot two here? Six foot three, four, five, all right, six foot then? Right. Come up, Chindu. Come on. Anybody who's not so tall but would like to be tall, as tall in heart. Vicky, come here. Vicky, come on. I can call on Vicky because she's my friend. Imagine there's a yoke between these two people. Yeah? Now, the purpose of a yoke, what is the purpose of a yoke? To share the, the load between two animals, yeah? And so, imagine these two are yoked. Who would the burden be on? Why? Why? Why would the burden be on Vicky? Yes, that's exactly it. The, the reason why the animals had to be the same species was because it needed to be equally balanced. And you couldn't have one who could run faster or one who could run slower. Why? Because you'd be dragging the other one. And if you put a donkey and an oxen together, you would kill the donkey. Now, if you just stoop down a bit. <laughs> that would work, wouldn't it? This is what Christ has done for us. Because it talks about being yoked. You can stand up now. He talks about being equally yoked. Take on my yoke. In other words, he's not going to do, let you do the work by yourself. He's going to come alongside you. He sent the Holy Spirit. You can sit down, guys. Thank you very much. He sent the Holy Spirit to come and work alongside with you. He will come at your pace. He'll come at your height. He'll come at your strength. And the reason why He does all these things is He tells you this. I am I am and the powers have nothing on him. Powers aren't humble. Powers aren't gentle. Do you know the symbol of the European Union is a bull? And on that bull is a naked woman. And the naked woman represents Europe or Eurasia. And the bull represents Zeus. And the story of the mythology is that what the bull does is Zeus dresses up in the power of a bull because he wants to seduce the woman. And he takes the woman and she's attracted by how powerful and how beautiful the bull looks. She gets on his back because he's trying to flee his jealous wife, who's a goddess. And she flees with him, thinking that she's safe. And then when he gets to the place that he needs to get to, the bull rapes the woman, and the produce is the king of Crete or Cyprus. The message of the story is the powers take what they want when they want it, they're not humble, and they seek to hurt, commit pain, and enslave people to their own whimsies and wills. But the one that we are to yoke ourselves to is humble and gentle. 1 Peter 3, 4-5, this is Peter talking to women. And he says about the adornment of jewels and the outside appearance, but this is what he says that women should see as beautiful. Rather, it should be that your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way that holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. This is a prophecy 
to the church. We are the bride of Christ. We are called to be gentle. We are called to be humble. It's not about our outside appearance. It's not about the flesh. It's not about the powers. It's not about the strength and the principalities. It's about the inner heart. It's to be yoked to Christ and follow His example. It says His burden is light, but He went to the cross. How can that be a light burden? He tells us to pick up our cross and follow after Him. Where does the burden become light? It's in the Spirit of God that is poured out on all men that we might have life and life to the full. Joel 3, 9-11, and I want to end with this. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations, from every side and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, Lord. And this is a beautiful passage because it goes on to say, in the valley of indecision. Make a decision today to follow after him and be as strong as an ox. Amen. Amen.